All right, let's go. Hi, um, welcome to this talk, Help the Hackers Get Your Data. Who am I? My name is Sergeant Branatz. I'm from Navi Saad. I'm a consultant who has been doing this for some 20 odd years. I am a founder and a team lead at Code for Hire. You can call me architecture software consultant who runs a team of heavy hitters. I also make developers uncomfortable and I make engineers very happy. <laughs> Wait for it. Uh, I'm a proud father of two beautiful girls. Uh, one is nine, the other one is almost five months now. Uh, if I'm not working or spending time with my family, I'm on a trail somewhere trying to get lost and see what happens. So, here is the full title of this talk because most of the conferences have a limited length uh, for the title. So, help the hackers get your data if you want to experience some very, 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 very unpleasant things and depending on whose data they might get, you might even face jail time, right? I'm a cynic. Um, I speak sarcasm as a native language. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, the fact that I have been doing a lot of rescue projects lately where, ha where I have been exposed to some questionable choices by developers does not help this situation in any way. Yeah? What, chair? No. <laughs> where was I? All right. Uh, so, yeah. Let's manage expectations, right? So, um, if you're ser ser still searching for the uh, answer, uh, what is the difference between a junior and a senior developer, this talk is not for you. If you are expecting some kind of DevOps hardcore security talk, you're going to be disappointed. If you are working in FinTech, I don't think there is a part of this talk that you haven't heard or used daily, and I hope that you are going to stay awake. For the rest of us, um, we know that security and secrets management is important, but do we really know the fallout, right? And please take note that every time I say you, I mean we, because I'm out there with you trying, making the same mistakes and trying to be better. All right. Uh, we deal with too many secrets in our professional lives, right? Some of them are less, some of them are more sensitive. Uh, we don't think about those things, basically, here's a credential, shove it in your config file, move away, don't think about it, right? As far as security goes, your average developer knows about OWASP, about XSS, about CSRF, and that they should sanitize their input, right? Uh, we have conferences talking about uh, code quality, uh, latest and the greatest, uh, whatever. Uh, we got talks about covariance, contravariance, architecture, how to get your code under control, uh, I don't know, whatever, right? We got actually conferences showing you the latest ponage, but people talking about the business consequences of poor security practices on your project, on your business, and your career that goes beyond you're so screwed, not even once, right? On top of that, when I start talking about this to C-suite people, to VPs of engineering, team leads, you, they really like it. They're like, you should really talk about this. They eye glints like heavy breathing, stuff like that. It really becomes uncomfortable. When I talk to developers about it, like, hey, <laughs> this is not important. That is the moment when I knew I was onto something, right? Um, I will be talking about secrets management while trying to look at it from a business uh, point of view. Um, this talk is aimed at developers who want to become engineers, right? Which means you will have to talk business and speak business. And in this industry, it still comes with the stigma of unclean which is really a shame because you can achieve so much more if you cared a bit. Talk, topic about business is like a whole new talk that is coming next season to a conference near you. And hopefully you will walk out of this talk with some actionable advice how to approach this, uh, this uh, matter and other subjects. So what I'm saying is that you should take your developer's hat off and put on your business hat. Because in 2018, uh, GDPR came to be, and suddenly a lot of people started being interested in what you're storing in, that, in your database and how you're storing it, right? Add to that HIPAA and other, and other standards, 
and suddenly your cost of not handling security is just too damn high. And here's your first takeaway. We as developers think and deal with cost in the same way we deal with security. It is not an integral part of our application lifecycle, right? And more often than not, it's just an afterthought. This happens thanks to our tunnel vision, uh, because that is prevalent in our industry, uh, where problems of this kind are treated as business problems that have nothing to do with development. In turn, um, this, mis this mistake can cost a lot of money because once, and it will happen, it is just a matter of time, uh, so it hits the fan, you will want to be in a position where you basically shrug and not go into full panic mode. When we start talking about security in uh, terms of uh, cost and expenses, uh, it starts to climb more and more on, on your priority list. Uh, and if you know how to explain it to management, you will get their buy-in to deal with it. On top of that, you will get their buy-in to do all the other stuff that you want to do because now they know that you're going to bring value to the table, right? As some, hopefully a lot of you, know that security is not a simple subject. It is quite wide, right? For the uh, intents and purposes of this talk, we're going to be talking about just one segment, and that is secrets management. Uh, it might be simplest to fix, but it can be a project or a company killer when mishandled. Excuse me. Now, a median of 7, 1,793 unique keys is leaked every day on Bitbucket, right? As my man says, please share the love, spread it. Leak it to, Bit, uh, to Bitbucket, to GitLab, to other services. I mean, why put your all, all of your eggs in one basket, right? So let this sink in. Give it a bit of time, right? This is wrong. You know it. I know it. But you know, things happen, mistakes are made, and all that, right? Let's try another one. In the first six months of 2019, 4.1 billion records were exposed by data breaches. 4.1 billion. Give it a bit of time for this information to sink in. If you do a quick math, it comes down to uh, 27 million records daily, right? But you know, is it really that bad? Why am I so pessimistic? I mean, you know, it might not be that bad. Let me put it another way. This kind of data terrifies me, and it should terrify you as well. The fallout of these data breaches is long and strong, right? These are the data points that keep, that, that keep me awake at night. Uh, whether we handled it right, whether it can be improved, whether we messed it up, and on that list, code quality, technical debt, do not appear. Because these kind of things can have an incredible potential damage to the business in costs both direct and indirect. So what are the common ways of revealing your secrets, right? Short answer, incompetence, ignorance, and hacking, right? Long answer, <laughs> leaving your data store publicly available, whether it is um, Elasticsearch, database, S3 bucket, or, you know, Mongo. <laughs> uh, in all these cases, it means that some poor soul got a task to set up a new data store, but they didn't bother with the security aspect, right? In case of Mongo, um, you know what? You don't care about your data. Uh, this thing has authentication turned off by default. You deserve everything that you get. Sorry. And of course, we have unauthorized access. Suppose somebody gains access to a server and it can be done regardless of your setup, and I hope you have it. If you're running Docker Kubernetes, I'm going to assume that your container is not running as root and that it is uh, running the latest version that has a most recent CVEs patched. I will get you to the GIF later. <laughs> If you have a dedicated infra or ops team, hopefully they have monitoring in place uh, with Nagios, Singa, or whatever they fancy. 
If you're working in a smaller company um, in that does not have this thing, uh, you can do it yourself, and the least that you can do is set up a tripwire like this. I'm sorry, it doesn't show very well, but basically this is a tiny little script that is going to send you a notification that any time that somebody opens an SSH connection, right? So we'll, you, will get you will get an email. So the person who is accessing your server operates under the assumption that there is some kind of tripwire in place, right? And that once they get in, the countdown clock starts. So they are going to race to collect as much data as it can, because later they can sift through it. If you have a tripwire, you will get a notification. You can check with the people who should have access to the server. If none of them raises their hand, like it's not us, then you can take steps, basically take the server offline and proceed from there. So if you have your secrets in uh, your config or uh, parameters YAML, you basically handed the keys to your kingdom to somebody else because you were nice and hospitable, right? <laughs> and you're about to experience many, many things. Some of them are quite unpleasant. From incurring a uh, cost for a security incident review by external consultants, uh, via losing profits uh, during the downtime, uh, losing your customer trust, uh, possible litigation that comes out from that, and your bestest code will have nothing to save you from this. On the other hand, your attitude toward cost and secret management might. Of course, secrets and conflicts are easy to commit, and then weird stories might happen. Let me tell you a story. So actually two stories. This is, this is one that I found rec like recently when I was writing this talk. The other one is kind of personal. So there was, a, uh, there was somebody who was trying to build a new application and they were caring about code quality and building it properly in architecture and everything else and they wanted to put it on AWS. But because it needed to, co to communicate with other services on AWS, they basically took their un unscoped IAM key and put it in a config file and then they committed and pushed to the repo. I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, no biggie. And some time passed and they ma made the repo public for 15 minutes. In those 15 minutes, somebody came, scanned the repo, picked up the IAM key and moved along. Uh, the person found out that the repo is public, took make the repo private again and thought that everything was fine. At the end of the month, they got a $15,000 bill because somebody got the keys and had a lot of fun with that, right? Yeah. AWS now has billing monitoring. Uh, GitHub now scans your commits for any kind of uh, data that looks like credentials and then it will flag your commit and notify you for you to review. But back then, hell no. Now, this, is, this one is personal, yeah. I think you know where this is going. So imagine a system that runs 24-7, uh, 365 days a year. This is a retail system that crunches, I don't know, tens of millions of, of, of data points for products. It uses a distributed system, it uses uh, spot instances because they are dirt cheap so you can compute it distributely and stuff like that. It does like 360 plus million per year in revenue, right? And we are building it and running it and we're very happy about it. So one fine morning we get an email from Amazon that tells us that uh, they found one of the uh, IAM keys that were used with a, that was associated with our account in the wild and that we should take security measures, rotate all the credentials, and yada, yada, yada. But before that, we do our own um, inspection and check. And turns out that that key has been deprecated some six months before. Nobody is using it, so no damage is done. We send an email to Amazon. Amazon says, fine. We say, fine. Everybody's happy. We move along, right? Everybody forgets about it. Fast forward six months. One fine morning, 6 a.m., I get up, uh, make me a coffee, sit in front of my screen, turn on my dashboard, and I see that something is wrong, right? The counters that are supposed to be there are not. There is no telemetry, there is no data, and what we got, the, the, the indicators are way above the acceptable thresholds. So, what's going on? Um, I log into the AWS console, 
um, I see that all of the spot instances are gone. And this is where the ro roller coaster ride starts. As I said, we are, we are leveraging spot instances because they are dirt cheap, gone. <coughs> to make matters even more fun, spot instances request, gone. Mm, okay, this is not going to be fun. EC2 instances that are running are present, they're working well. I cannot spin up any new hardware, so I'm kind of screwed at this point. This is going to be trouble, and I know this is going to be a long day. I'm trying to contact Amazon support. I'm not getting back, back any response. Time passes, three hours in. Um, I have some three hours more before the day shift starts coming in, and I need to have at least some of the data process for them so they can work. I decide to call the CTO of the company because it is ass o'clock in their time zone. Nobody picks up. It sends me to voicemail multiple times. Um, I'm trying to again contact Amazon support with my phone number because my, my email is not on file. Nobody responds. All right, time passes. It is noon, 6 a.m. Eastern, Eastern Seaboard time. CTO gets, wakes up, sees the messages, sees the voicemails. He comes online, we start talking. And this is where I realized I just had a master class in chaos engineering. The email that was used for AWS support is not something that he uses regularly. Uh, by regularly, I mean he checks it maybe once a year. It took him about an hour to find the password. All right, found the password, logged in, support actually notified him, like, hey, we are going to shut down your account until you get back to us, but you know. Um, there was no one to reply, so he contacted the AWS support, clears it with them. Everything should be now operational. Two hour, another two hours pass. We are now in our eight of the outage, right? And the information is coming, uh, coming in about what has happened. And this was incredibly hard to do because AWS is pretty tight-lipped about that. So that key from the beginning that I mentioned, that what everybody said this was fine, was flagged in a back audit and Amazon decided to protect us by blocking our account. Yeah, and they used the email on file to notify us. Now, with everything clear, the system should be coming back online, so next another hour or so passes. I asked about the spot instance request, they go like, yeah, it's done, because uh, AWS has a scorched earth policy, uh, should first ask questions later in situations like this because it is cheaper for them to do this than actually be liable and go into litigation about, about the expenses. Next few hours, and this is on me because I didn't have that part automated, I honestly never thought that this could happen. I put back all the systems online and 16 hours later or so, we are back in business and operational. So, can anybody guess what is the damage? Ballpark it. One million in revenue for that day, plus daily wages for 300 plus people who were supposed to work but were, but were prevented from working by that outage. They're gonna get paid, yeah. But yeah, you know, um, you're more sophisticated than that, you're enlightened, you are with a hip crowd and you know better, so now you're using environment variables instead of config files. Awesome sauce, yeah, sure. Um, so you have your local development .n file, you have a .n file on your production. You can do uh, make sure that it is not committed with git ignore or whatever so source control you're using. Great. So you're decreasing your chance of problems. But you know, people do stupid things in production. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> right? Yeah. Then again, even if you have your envir environment files unindexed and used properly for a skilled person that has access to your box, they need to execute something like that and they will collect all of your environment variables and you're back again in the problem situation. But yeah, you're using containers, woohoo, yeah, good for you, right? So you're now passing environment variables to the Docker engine, which then you could use something like this to list them for your container not to mention the ever-increasing mess as you need to pass more and more environment variables to your containers, for example, via Docker file, which then starts to look like this. And as this monster grows, how many hours are going to be wasted by 
keeping in sync your team with the newly added values and variables in your .n files. And here's an even better question. How secure is your way of sharing those secrets? Are you sending them by an email or a chat client? Is it encrypted and stuff like that? Sure. <laughs> We're going to switch to Docker secrets, right? You're telling me that you want to use a file-based clear text located in slash run slash secrets slash variable name? Please, tell me more about security, <laughs> right? Even if you squint real hard and pretend that this is not an issue, right? You should keep in mind that some of the, even some of the official Docker images can have vulnerabilities, right? And I'm sure that each and every one of you actually inspect those images that you use instead of playing Pokemon because you gotta have them all, <laughs> right? Now, if you're working on a project that has a dedicated or infra or ops team and they allow problems like this in production, you really need to have a long talk with them with business present and explain to them that they are damaging the business and they need to shape up, right? So now it's time to look at the consequences of these kind of problems. Up to this point, I talked about some concepts. I still haven't used their names. So if you, um, sorry. So if you have, still haven't figured them out, here they are, oh, sorry. Ha, here they are. Liability and criminal negligence, right? Here's a little experiment. Um, ask your boss to have company counsel present and have a sit down because you want to learn what is going to happen in case when your company gets sued after the data breach, right? And um, you start, uh, and when, you're, when you need to prove reasonable, reasonable security practices, right? And you're going to be asked like, what are we doing about that? And you're going to say, well, you know, we're storing our credential in config files. Sure, what are config files? Well, those are files on the server, okay. So what does clear text mean? That means that anybody who can open that file can actually read that information, right? When you tell them that, sit back, relax, and wait for them to grasp the situation. Then you're probably going to be introduced to a nice term called criminal negligence. Yeah. But you have insurance, some of you will think, and you're covered for this issue. Are you sure? Maybe you're covered against cyber attack until it's time to claim it. Then you are again going to have to explain your reasonable, reasonable security practices or when, you, when it's time to uh, adjust your premiums, right? Good luck to you when you have to explain to your adjuster that you're storing your credentials in a clear, clear, clear or plain text, right? You guys, you will prevail. Or we can come to certification. Hopefully, specifically actually, uh, ISO 27000, right? Hopefully, a lot of you are going to work on a project where this comes into play and where some of the bigger sales are actually hinging on the fact whether you have this certificate or not. You're going to find, find and learn pretty quickly that things get costly really, really fast. And because um, your security secrets management was not high on your, on your priority list and you cared more about your academic reasoning, that you have your best code, right? And this is, this is the second takeaway. This is why I'm talking about cost and security together because more often than not, they are the same facet of business. The cost and the damage control, maximizing the profits uh, while not by not losing sales and decreasing your liability potential, right? All right, so at this point, uh, we know how we ended up in this situation. Uh, we know why it is a bad situation. Now we can talk about how this situation can be improved. The answer is simple, sure. Uh, it's called secrets management application, right? But what makes a good secret management application system? First is ease of setup, right? You want to be able to uh, set up and configure your system relatively easy. The configuration should be straightforward and should not be ambiguous. Uh, you should also have a clear path to upgrade uh, or upscale to high availability solution or a uh, multi-data center solution, right? 
uh, and your, the way that your applications communicate with the secret management system should be as straightforward as possible. It is also a good idea to have a secret that expires and your application should not care about this. All it, all it knows, it emits a request and new data comes in. That's it. On the other hand, the ease of changes to, uh, that your administra uh, administrators or whoever is in charge of this, this part, um, the ease that they can, uh, the ease with which they can change the secrets in this system is important because you want them to be efficient and cost effective. And this, this, is, this is my favorite, right? Um, on the surface, doesn't look like much. But once you start thinking in terms of business, it opens a, a lot of options. Um, if you squint real hard, right, if you, if you try, you can consider your whole configuration a secret, which means it can be stuffed into your secret management system, right? But then, depending on the token used, you will get different values, meaning you can have a token for production, you can have a token for staging, you can have a token for testing, you can have a token for whatever, right? And you get different values based on the key. Now, add to that what we were talking about, about the development environment, and suddenly you have a nice cost reduction and increased security, because you will not be sharing secrets uh, anymore via email, instant messenger, whatever, right? Uh, and the time wasted by your developers waiting for the new version of whatever goes down and the system, the system will never, never be in a problem and you will make, oh, sorry, this was clumsy, you will be making more money. Do I need to explain this? No. All right, good. Thankfully, nobody's beyond redemption here. <laughs> uh, choices of backends, right? Um, whether you use uh, local uh, secure encrypted storage or you can use RDBMS or some AWS service or Google Cloud Platform service or whatever, um, it increases the value of the system because it means they can be tailored, tailored better to your needs and that is a very good thing. And of course, cost, right? Let's be honest here. We all like cost to be zero. This is of course impossible, uh, but we can do a lot to keep them down. Uh, by having a straightforward installation and configuration, your team will spend less billable hours on those tasks. By having um, something like dynamic secrets, uh, you can make your setup simpler and you can have a more productive team where a downtime due, conf due to configuration becomes a thing of the past, right? Tools that uh, manage secrets are nothing new. They have been out there for a long time. Uh, there is quite a few of them. This is just a small subset of them. Um, some of these tools are quite good. Some of these tools are weird, meaning one of these, I can't remember the name, one of these requires for you to recompile the application and redeploy it every time you change your secret, which is kind of weird, right? <laughs> but whenever I can, I like to use software that is backed by company. And of course, we can't escape them. <laughs> AWS is everywhere, so we're going to have to talk about their offering in, in this arena. And AWS Secrets Manager is, I think, one of two or three similar products that they offer. Basically, it is uh, AWS native way of storing uh, secure static key value pairs, right? It has some rotational ability, uh, outside, but outside of RDS, you, you essentially have to write this, these things up uh, by yourself. Also, Secrets, Management, Secrets Manager is single region only. If that is not a problem, there is a bigger potential issue and that is the price because it, it can widely differ depending on your usage. So here's an example. Production scale web application, right? Nothing fancy, two SSH keys per server, two database credential, blah, blah, blah. Six dollars a month in total, right? This is fine, this is manageable, right? Let's try another uh, example. Using microservices, five million secrets that are valid for one hour with two API calls per secret per month, that is almost $3,000 per month. That is a lot of money, right? So, the other name that you're probably going to hear a lot if you start digging into this matter is HashiCorp Vault. It is probably the most commonly heard name 
in secret storage and infrastructure these days, right? This is the company that brought us Terraform and Vagrant. So why it is a good fit? Um, because it is a small binary to install, uh, the configuration is relatively straightforward. Uh, with use of, use of SSL certificates, you get a nice secured HTTP transport uh, for your secrets. This can be done by a single developer or a non-dedicated info person because it is really simple. On top of that, you have high availability mode um, available out of the box. And if you need to scale it up to uh, a console or Zookeeper solution or whatever, you can depending on your need. It also has multiple backends, which is certainly a plus, which means you can tailor it better to your needs. And it has this thing. Um, I apologize in advance if I, if I butchered the name. It's, it's really difficult. Uh, so Vault uses a technique called Shamir's secret sharing algorithm created by Adi Shamir. Uh, it is used to secure a secret in a distributed way. More, most often it is used to uh, secure the encryption keys, right? Uh, the secret is split into multiple parts called shards, and these shards are used to uh, reconstruct the original secrets. To unlock the secret via Shamir secret sharing, you need a minimum, minimum number of shares, which you define, and this is called a threshold. That means that you have an elegant solution to prime and unlock your vault when, for example, one of your shareholders is on top of some mountain without cell coverage. Right? One, of the, one of the most important things that needs to be mentioned here is that uh, vault has this thing called policies, which is basically an ACL rule. Right? You have a root policy that is built in that allows access to everything. Uh, you can create any number of policies that are named and find control, uh, fine grain uh, your control over the paths, right? This is important to clarify because, as I said, Vault operates exclusively in whitelist mode, uh, meaning that unless uh, access is explicitly granted via a policy, the action is not going to be allowed. But because user can have multiple policies associ associated with their token, action in any of those policies that exist that allows is going to allow for the vault to return the data. So this is kind of tricky to implement and be careful of. So if everything is awesome, right, there are no problems. Well, there are. There are a few issues. Uh, first is sealing and unsealing of the vault. Uh, when you start your server, when you start your C vault server, your, your vault storage is sealed. It needs to be unlocked by those shares and threshold that I mentioned before, which means you need to really, really have a good procedure in place, how, you, how you're gonna deal with it, how many people have access to those shares, how many shares do you need, what do you do if somebody is not present, what is the hierarchy of people who are going to be called in order, and yada, yada, yada. So you really need to think about that thing. The other thing that is a problem, and this is, perhaps a downside, is uh, HTTP calls. Any communication with Vault goes as an HTTP request, right? In, I'm certain that in 90% of the cases, this is not a problem, but um, if your network, is, network stack is uh, over text, you can encounter latency, but then you can fix it and do something with it. Uh, on the other hand, if you really want to push the issue, on one hand, you have this per perceived performance hit, on the other hand, you have this idea of being able to sleep nice at night and not being bothered by the problems, right? Being a, uh, a, a security-minded business person, I think the choice is clear. On the other hand, if you really want to go at it, you can use HTTP, HTTP2, which makes all these problems go away. So how does it all fit together? Uh, Vault token goes into config file. Yeah, I know, I run it, sorry. Token gets sent to the Vault server and client token is returned. That is basically a cookie for, your, for the, the same principle as a cookie for the website. Uh, only re retrieval of the secrets uh, granted by the ACL assigned is possible. When lease on the token uh, has expired, Vault token is used to obtain a new one. In case of breach, your tripwire is triggered. Your files are downloaded, possibly your config files as well. You remove the server wasn't me. No, I still have them. Not me. 
There's a mouse there. Yeah. Not oh. sure. Oh. Good. That was sweet. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> See? But I'm using volts, so I'm safe. As I said, in case of breach, your tripwire system is triggered. Uh, your files are downloaded, possibly your configuration as well. Uh, you remove the server from public. You rotate the token generated and everything else that you need. You update the config. You make the server publicly available again and move on with your day. A question that is asked a lot whether you should use secret management on every project. Um, it really depends on, on, on what you're handling. I have a list similar to this, which, is, which gives me a yes, no outcome. So basically, if you're storing user data that might be personally identifiable information, sure. If you're using any kind of sensitive data, absolutely yes, you should use secrets management. If you're using any kind of payments, storing any kind of payments in your system, yeah, definitely you should. So you, I go through this list, it gives me a yes or no outcome. If I'm in a position to uh, make that call, I do. If I'm not, I present it to the management, try to get their buy-in. If they agree, awesome. If not, they do their cost analysis, cost-benefit analysis, and if they decide it is not worth their time, more props to them, I would just like to have it in writing, right? Because you want to have this. Still, uh, even with potential drawbacks, using Vault or similar system pays off a lot uh, because your company and your product is going to be protected from unwanted liabilities and in case of actual unauthorized server access, your configuration sh configurations will be stored securely. Because according to IBM research, the average cost of a large data breach in which more than 1 million records are lost in 2018 is $3.9 million. Now, 1 million records. Remember when we, when we did the quick math at the beginning? Every day, 27 million records. That means 27 times, right? This figure of $3.9 million takes into account many categories of expenses that arise from the breach. Uh, lost, lost business, uh, technical investigations, uh, security audit, legal penalties, PR companies that are going to handle that mess for the public, uh, employee time spent for recovery, right? With all this in mind, I believe it is significantly cheaper to invest engineering time to, to fix this low-hanging fruit than run it, let it run its deadly course. Thank you. Questions? Nope. Any questions? Going once, going twice, done. See ya.